Welcome back to part three. I'm glad that you're joining me again for the third part of this four-part series. And if you haven't seen the first couple of videos that I've done about wood burning appliances, then I recommend you go back and have a look. By now you should know the different types, the, the main different types that you might find in a home you're buying or that you might want to buy and put into your home yourself. Of course, some of those units are outdated and need to be updated and to make them safe. So today's video is on inspections. And as you can see here, the inspection process is quite involved and you have to go through the stove with a fine tooth comb, looking at this hearth pad and so on. In this series, I'm only gonna really focus on freestanding wood stove inspections. It would probably be hours for me to go through everything that uh, you might come across in your home. So we're gonna talk about freestanding wood stoves only. I think you'll have a better understanding of the process of inspection, whether I'm doing it or someone else is doing it, or if you don't require it, that you're going to do it for yourself. So here's an actual inspection I did uh, and recorded to give you a demonstration of the process that I use to inspect the freestanding wood stove. So as you can see here, this stove is mounted on the wall and so in other words, the back is parallel to the wall. In the, also in this case, you can see there's a shield behind the stove. The, the person that owned this home wanted the stove closer to the wall because that particular stove, let's say, needed 18 inches away from the wall. If you make the stove 18 inches away from the wall, it's going to be sitting in the middle of the room. So you can shield the wall uh, to, re to reduce that distance up to 66%. In this case, he shielded it um, with a metal shield and it gets a 66% reduction. Um, the process of inspection, for me at least, the way I do it, and everybody probably does it different, but I like to start from the ground and work my way right up to the, to the ceiling and then into the attic and then above the roof. So in this video, you can see where I'm going through the process of measuring the hearth pad, which has to be 18 inches to the front, eight inches to the sides, and eight inches to the back. Then I'm looking at the black stove pipe, measuring the stove pipe distance from the wall. If you have a, a single wall stove pipe, which is the old style, again, from a last video on chimneys, you remember that we had the, just a snap lock style chimney pipe, and then we went to, uh, a better style, a thicker steel, better quality pipe, but still single wall. That requires you to be 18 inches away from anything combustible. So that's the one process. This particular stove has a double wall stove pipe and is only required to have six inches of clearance. One of the very first things you want to check, whether you're buying a stove or you have a stove already installed in a home you're buying, let's say, is look for the label. The label contains very valuable information. Now, you have to remember that if it has a label, then it's been tested in a lab. Essentially, here's how it works. The manufacturer builds the stove, and then they know the size of the test cubicle that in the lab, and there's various labs. There's Warnock, Hershey, and OTL, and CSA, and all kinds of UL. So, they know the size of this cubicle and they also know where the sensors in the walls of this cubicle are located. And what they do is they build their stove and they put it in a similar test lab in their own manufacturing facility and they move the stove around until it meets the requirements by the lab. Because they know when they take the stove to the lab it's going to have to be tested. So they basically will, will pull the stove away from the wall and test it so that they know that when they bring it to the lab, it's going to be, if they say it, it's allowed to be eight inches away from the wall, for instance, if it's, if it's uh, installed parallel to the back uh, wall, they know that it will not set the sensor off given the parameters of the test process. And I don't want to get into that too much, but essentially they will, will make a label on the back of the stove. And that label gives you all the information you need from, oftentimes at least, uh, 
the distance from the back of the stove, the distance uh, from the ceiling, the distance from the sides of the stove, the type of hearth pad you need, the manufacturer, the date it was made, the model, the make, um, on and on and on. So that is a critical component and it's often located down on the side or if it's located at the back, it's, a, it's small. If you're fortunate enough to be buying a unit, then you can actually look at the book and read it out of the book. Uh, again, the, the label supersedes the uh, wet inspection basically. If the label, if the manufacturer says it needs nine inches, but every other stove needs four or needs 12, whatever the case may be, you have to go by the label. If the stove doesn't have a label, then it's not certified. In other words, it was never tested in a lab and it has to be treated as a non-certified stove, which means it has to have 48 inches basically all, right, all the way around it. We don't see too many of those stoves, but when we do see them, uh, it's pretty, pretty tough to pass them uh, because basically they have to meet such stringent requirements and they take up a lot of space to do that. Now we're going to look at the other components of the stove, including the flue pipe. We're going to start by looking at the inside of the stove. So we'll check the door seal, the gaskets, make sure that the brick is in good condition, that the ash pan's in good condition, um, and that the stove hasn't generally been abused or cracked welds or anything like that. Anything that would make it unsafe. So now we're going to move into the next component on the stove, working our way up, is the flue pipe either single wall or double wall as we explained before. With double wall pipe you need a minimum of six inches of clearance. With single wall pipe you need 18 inches of clearance but you can shield the pipe or shield the wall to get a 50 percent reduction so you can be as close as nine inches if you have proper shielding in place. The other thing you want to look at when you're talking about flue pipe is how is it connected to the flue pipe adapter, which is the piece that goes through the wall or through the ceiling. Make sure that it's screwed together properly. Three screws per joint minimum. The only time you don't have to do that is at the expansion joint. So one other thing to consider when we're talking about black flue pipe is the orientation. Now you want to make sure that your orientation is correct because creosote could run down the chimney and run out between the joints if the orientation is not correct. So you want to have the mail on the top or the mail on the inside uh, going downward so that as the creosote runs down the chimney it stays inside the pipe and when it reaches the stove it also will be inside the flue collar on the top of the stove. You don't want creosote running all over the top of your stove. If you're using a double wall pipe, it gets a little confusing because your outside part of your double wall pipe will slip over top of the flue collar on the stove, but the inside, the stainless steel part, will fit inside the stove collar. So that'll be correct. So the other thing that you have to consider is the rise of the flue pipe. You always want to make sure that your flue pipe is rising as it leaves the stove. Never have a situation where the horizontal part of the flue pipe is going downhill. Otherwise, as it begins to cool, creosote will run the wrong way and smoke might spill into your house. And that's something we're going to talk about a little bit in part four, troubleshooting. So now the next part of this series is going to be looking at the stainless steel chimney. Now it gets even more complicated than the black flue pipe uh, for a few reasons. First of all, let's go back in history a bit. If you watched part two of this series, you would remember that there is two types of stainless steel chimneys that we developed starting in the 50s and then changed in the early 80s. So the first type was a one inch thick wall chimney that was rated for around a thousand degrees Fahrenheit and we called that a type A chimney which we have designated S610 or 610. That type of chimney was used for many years with wood stoves but we found that it was basically getting too hot if there was a chimney fire 
and it would oftentimes burn down someone's home. So again, a chimney fire can get up to 2,000 degrees, essentially. So what we did was we developed new chimney systems that had a two inch thick wall, and we rated them S629. And in the early 80s, it was made mandatory that if you had a stove that had an S610, 1,000 degree rated chimney, that you'd have to change that chimney out and put in an S629 chimney because it was obviously safer. Again, most wood stoves are only burning around 650 degrees, but if your creosote starts on fire, then you might get up to 1500 to 2000 degrees in that chimney. And the new chimneys are rated again for 2100 degree, and they test them in a lab to show that they will actually withstand up to three 30 minute fires at 2100 degrees without failing. Now, when we get in the attic space and we start looking at this chimney, we look for a label. And that's the, that's the key component right there. That label will tell you if it's S629 or if it is the old style S610. A lot of times you're not going to find a label. So then you have to look at the top of the chimney to see if it's a one inch wall or a two inch wall, thick wall. If it's a two inch thick wall, generally it's going to be S629 rated. Um, there are a couple of exceptions. Excel um, by ICC is one exception. Um, Selkirk has a chimney that is rated S629, but it's only one inch thick wall. And there's new chimneys coming out quite a bit. I'm starting to see new ones. I think Duravent has one that are only one inch thick wall, but they're S629 rated. Well, again, just like the stove, you have to go by the label. It has to be S629 high temp chimney or 2100 degree chimney. If it's not, the inspection fails. Chimneys came with a kit that allowed you to pass the stainless steel chimney through the ceiling or through the wall. And that kit was made specifically to prevent fire where they basically pass through the wall or through the ceiling. The important factor to remember about chimneys is they must have two inches of clearance. And when you look in the attic space and the chimney is packed around it with insulation, then it doesn't pass all the way up through the roof including the shingles and the framing and the ceiling all must maintain two inches of clearance as you can see here when the chimney passes through the inside of a home it must be boxed in so that homeowners can't access it touch it dry clothes on it and so on when looking in the attic the very first thing you should see is the attic radiation shield and again you must make sure that your chimney is two inches away from anything combustible including the insulation and that's why we use the fire stop as you can see here make sure that fire stop is secure even when your chimney is in a chase it must maintain two inches of clearance and it must be braced about the halfway point or at least every eight feet. Now if the chimney comes through the wall like this one does you need to have a proper wall pass through. Depending on the manufacturer they'll look a little different but they're all basically the same. And then you have to have the chimney braced. So in this case you can see this chimney has two inches of clearance between the siding and the chimney itself and there's a brace within eight feet of the base. In this case the base is actually too tight to the ground and there's no access to get in and clean out the bottom of the chimney. If the chimney has rusted through then it's no longer certified. In this case when you look close you can see that someone has used two types of chimneys so the base T comes through as one type of chimney and then as you look up the chimney you can see that the chimney above it is actually a different diameter and it's not a perfect fit therefore it doesn't pass you're not allowed to mix and match chimney manufacturers so again the brace and then where it passes through the soffit material you have to make sure that there's nothing combustible within the soffit within two inches of the chimney the area above the roof 
you start by looking at the flashings. So the first part of the flashing is on the roof itself and then you look at the storm collar to make sure that it is cocked to the chimney. Make sure the flashing is up under the shingles far enough that it's not going to leak. In this case you can see that the top edge of the flashing is not below the shingle. So this could leak. Finally, you need to look at the chimney and determine if it is three feet out of the roof and two feet higher than anything within ten feet. In this case, the peak is the highest point, but that's not always going to be the case. So you need to make sure it's high enough. If the chimney is not braced, you should be able to move it around inside the flashing on the roof. So with this chimney, you can see it's approximately five feet out of the roof. So you have to ask yourself, why so high? Well, the rules state that the chimney must be a minimum of three feet out of the roof and two feet higher than anything within 10 feet. So in this case, I'm using a level to try to pinpoint the location of where the 10 foot mark would intersect with the chimney and then determine if the chimney is two feet higher than that point. When a chimney is over five feet out of the roof, in order to achieve that rule, then we must brace the chimney as you can see here. When you're bracing the chimney, it's a good idea to try to keep your braces as horizontal as possible and approximately 90 degrees from each other. Um, sometimes when the chimney's close to the edge of the roof like this one is, you can't do that. So um, you do the best you can. And the, these components are supplied by the manufacturer. Finally, the last thing that you want to do is look down the inside of the chimney to make sure that there's no defects or any problems with the chimney on the inside. And that's pretty much the inspection of a wood burning appliance, in this case a freestanding wood stove, along with the black pipe and the stainless steel chimney all the way up to the cap. Thanks for watching and sticking with me to the end. I hope that you've learned something and stay tuned for episode 4, Problem Solving.